Here we are with Werner Vinge in San Diego. Uh, he graciously uh, permitted us to interview him, and so we will be talking for a few minutes about a singularity. Hi, Werner. Hi, David. Uh, I wanted to uh, remind our listeners uh, about uh, your seminal article with NASA 15 years ago, um, uh, uh, which was one of the first to reintroduce the concept of uh, technological singularity, which originally was uh, developed by von Neumann and Ulam in the, in the 40s. But certainly you were uh, the one to, to bring it uh, to a wider audience and to formulate it more uh, precisely. So um, tell us a little bit what happened uh, in the last uh, 15 years. Uh, how do you feel the concept having been uh, explored by the specialists? It seems to me that the uh, uh, progress in, in the direction of the singularity has, has, uh, has actually gone along without too many great surprises. One difference that is, is not so much a matter of time, although it applies to the von Neumann case, is uh, the, uh, the, 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 the question of uh, uh, what, it, what is it that is making it happen. And to me, the, the singularity comes down to making uh, or becoming things that are smarter than humans. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is the fundamental crux of that. If it, if it doesn't happen, if that doesn't happen, then von Neumann's vision of progress going so fast that people can't understand it, that probably isn't going to happen. That's right. Um, so there has been uh, some progress among the specialists and, and people who study the, the concept uh, deeply like you in, in trying and depict actually post-singular scenarios. Um, the event horizon uh, interpretation of the singularity is one that says you cannot look beyond uh, the event horizon, but your job is, uh, as a science fiction writer, to falsify that vision and still try hard and uh, uh, see humanity living in a post singular world. So, what I, I am, I am probably more strongly than most people on this on the side of the uh, of, of how you phrased it the event horizon and not being able to see beyond the analogy being uh, between us and the rest of the animal kingdom mm -hmm. that they a, a goldfish could not understand what we are doing here this afternoon, you know, with this interview. Uh, on the other hand. Um, uh, especially if the transition uh, it takes years, uh, it's clear that uh, what humanity is doing is important in, in affecting the outcome, hopefully in ways that you know are, are beneficial uh, to us. And at the same time, if it takes a long time for it to happen, the uh, humans of the era will probably be benefiting by technology that comes along their intelligence will be benefited, either by intelligence amplification or by biomedical things. So um, it, may tr it may turn out that, that although I am right about the claims of unintelligibility, about the, the claim of the event horizon, about the claim of, um, uh, of uh, how things smarter than us we can't understand, that may be a moot point if, as we go there, we become smarter. Yep. And Hans Moravec, uh, uh, in 80, 80, 82, I think I was at an AI conference at Carnegie Mellon, and I, and I used this term singularity in a, in a panel. And I was talking to Han, first met him at that time, and and he already had he already knew all this, but uh, he said I, I, did, I agree with everything that you're saying, except I wouldn't use the term singularity for it, because if you are one of the participants, this won't be an unintelligible transition. It will be a nice, smooth. And he says, I intend, to, I intend to ride that curve, and it will be quite clear to me what's going on. Absolutely. And, and, the, and the speed uh, of, of change, the, the, the first and second derivatives of that curve, uh, are important uh, not only for technologists, but for society at large. The adaptability of, of humans is, is finite. So uh, certainly the, the faster the change, the more difficult for us to keep uh, riding the curve, as Hans said. And um, I wonder whether 
you have an opinion regarding um, the uptake of the concept of singularity or accelerating change by society at large, by uh, non-technologists, educators, politicians, uh, and, and whether they have come to grips with it at all? Uh, I, don't, I don't think it is consciously impinged especially. I think it, whether or not it, 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 such conscious acknowledgement becomes important enough also depends on how fast that it, it, it happens. If it happens very, it, it, to me, the faster it happens, the more uncomfortable I am about it. Mm -hmm. That you could imagine situations where uh, the situation that you described earlier and in, in off camera, where you get immense changes that are absorbed by some segment of society that then kind of moves away from the rest. Uh, that, that's very uh, un, 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 unsettling. Not, not necessarily disaster. If, if the people that are, the, 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 these people who are getting smarter and their machines getting smarter would, would probably be more benign than, than, than most elite factions in, in the past. Yep. Um, but it's still, it's still un, unsettling to me. The extreme version, what I call a hard takeoff, where it all happens in a hundred hours or so. Um, I don't. That sounds very scary to me. Yeah. Um, and yet, reasoning by analogy, that's not. I, I do. I do not regard that as implausible as some people. Most of my friends who talk about the singularity regard that as terribly unlikely and unbelievable that it could happen so fast. And certainly, I'm not advocating that it happens so fast. I find I find that particular possibility very scary. The the thing about it that has a certain amount of plausibility uh, for me is by analogy with the the most recent comparable event to singularity, which was the rise of humans within the animal kingdom. And from the standpoint of local animals. I think that the uh, uh, that the uh, humans did look preternaturally adaptable and preternaturally fast in how fast they could bring changes into the environment. No, I'm not talking about 20th century, 21st century humans. I'm talking about you know, yeah. Paleolithic humans. Yeah, between uh, before the invention of agriculture and after the invention of agriculture, there has passed the time which is from a biological standpoint is just an eye right. blank. And, and the animals right. had no chance right. of being able to adapt. And, and even even before the adventure of agriculture, just the the way that humans would learn to hunt, you know, extreme adaptability. Now, nature can do that too. Nature can adapt critters to hunt uh, other critters, but it takes a lot longer because it's natural selection and evolution. So, uh, just reasoning by evo by uh, by analogy. One might speculate that something that was smarter than us would have an equivalent speed up, and there there is a small when you look at at, net, at network changes, uh, in communication network changes, uh, and uh, there's a, a little bit of support for that. Do you remember the the uh, studies of uh, like the slammer worm? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Uh, that uh, I, I think they concluded that it had gone from initiation. To saturation of, accept, of the accessible targets in the world across the world within like 20 minutes. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so one can imagine that uh, if there was a network substrate to what was going on, that uh, once you got superhuman intelligence, you would get a rapid bootstrap, and uh, none of this decade, decades long, slow and uh, you know evolution toward toward change. Something that would happen in the afternoon. And I'm not saying that that's the way it's going to be. I'm just saying a hard takeoff is an imaginable, is imaginable, and it uh, it looks like it would not be attractive. It looks like it would be one of the more dangerous ways for this sort of thing to happen.